I am excited to explore this medium because I think comic books are great. I really enjoyed reading them when I was a kid and especially the artwork. Here's an old Spider-Man comic. And what I want you to notice is that the, well, the color is bold, usually flat, bold color, especially on the, on the covers compared to, say, the inside. Well, actually, look, here's the inside of an, a comic from the, from the 80s, from when I was a kid. But then here's a more recent comic from, say, when my son was a kid. And so now what we're seeing is co comic companies are using different inks on the end, maybe different paper too, like this paper is glossier. So the ink is just way more intense. It's not as, as faded and low intensity as that sort of traditional comic book ink. And then, of course, nowadays, graphic novels are popular. Here's a Romeo and Juliet graphic novel. And the, the ink is very similar to this Star Wars comic ink, you know, so it's that really glossy, intense ink. Comic book art follows a specific process, and you can, you can get a sense of this process, actually, when you, when you look at, say, the, the first page, down at the bottom, it actually has listed the writer of the comic, the penciler, inker, letterer. Is that a word? Letterer. <laughs> Colorist and editor and then editor-in-chief. So what that means is that, of course, somebody had to write the story, right? All right, but then the script goes to the artist. Now, the first artist would be the penciler. So someone would draw each page. Then the, the drawing would the drawings would go to the inker, and so the inker would then add the, the black outlines and also the tones. So like if you see here on Spider-Man, let me zoom in a little bit, that he does have some tones on him. And there, it, it's kind of like when I, when I was referencing my horse composition and when I was making my tonal plan, I was focused primarily on the really strong dark tones, and I even shaded them in, them in as shapes. That's very sim similar to what we see in comic book art, where the artists have inked in, or the inker has inked in, the really dominant dark tones, and they're done as shapes. Look at this comic. This is a Batman comic. From, uh, this is that particular animated Batman series. It was on TV, and, and they even have comics of it. Have a look at what we see here. There we go. Again, really strong, dominant, dark tones represented as shapes. And so, like... The, the inker is using flat, bold, black. You can really tell in this one here. So on Batman there. Flat, bold, intense, black, you know. Try to find another page where there's... Here. Right there. Quite a bit of... Quite a bit of black, dark tone shapes. I want to go back to this Spider-Man one because... Along with those bold, dark tone shapes, these inkers would also start to create some middle tones. Now, if you look carefully on Spider-Man here, you can see that the artist has put in the dark tone, but then started transitioning it away like that into a middle tone. You see that there? And we see evidence of that all over in comic book art. <clears throat> a 
look at these middle tones that the artist has used here. So if this is my bold dark tone shape, to transition it to a middle tone, I could start making lines like this. And the term cross hatching came about because artists would do things like this in order to help transition the tone from dark to middle and then to light. They would crisscross their ink lines. If you study the comic book art, we see a lot of parallel lines. So, for instance, right here, as this dark tone transitions to a middle tone, we see the shape is something like this. So that's a distinct bold shape, but then it, it transitions away with a few hatch lines like that, but they're usually parallel. We don't actually see a lot of crisscrossing necessarily. Here's another great example of that where we see this dark tone on this character's back transitioning to a middle tone with a few hatches. We see that all over. So it's primarily, the, the inkers would primarily emphasize those strong dark tones, but then transition it away with a little bit of middle tone hatching, like on Spider-Man's bicep there. Let's take a look at this Star Wars comic, which is more of a modern comic, say in the last 10 to 15 years it was published. So here's a, a nice example of that middle tone hatching. Actually, and this is, this is interesting, here we do see the traditional cross hatching. I'll try to zoom in where the artist has actually crisscrossed the lines. To create a gradation, a tonal gradation. So it's all about density. So the, the dark, the, the more dense the, the ink or the more lines on the paper, the darker the tone will be right there. But of course, the, the uh, inker's main concern would be those, of course, dominant dark, dark shapes. Like we see on this illustration, Here's a nice example of the cross hatching. Okay, you get the idea. So, yes, there's black outlines, but there's also the shading of dominant dark tones. Here's a Daredevil cover. So look at those dark tone shapes on Daredevil and some on Captain America. There's some of that nice hatching or some mi middle tone treatment on Captain America's thigh. I am going to mimic that with my horse composition here. Now that's gonna be step one for me, is like doing the inking with, uh, I'm just gonna use Sharpie. I'm gonna use the standard size, which is actually a fine point. It's called fine point. That's that standard size Sharpie. But then I'm also going to use the ultra fine. So now I'm, I'm fulfilling the role of the inker. I'm gonna ink this to establish the tones and I'm gonna follow my tonal plan. When I'm finished inking it, I am going to add the color with the, the fresh bold markers, not with the dried out markers. Here I go.
To start establishing both dark and middle tones, I use the larger Sharpie to trace a shape and then shade it in. And then I grab the finer Sharpie and I can make some of the middle tone, middle tones with more of the, the parallel lines or, or the, the hatching. And so you can see evidence of that here where I've got the dominant dark tone shape and then lines extending off of it to represent the middle tone. The other thing I want you to notice is that in this large dark tone shape at the top, this one, I chose to not just color it all in black. That's too big of a shape to have just all black. I want some middle tones in there. So I allowed some of the white of the paper to show through. And I could go back in and even use my ultra fine Sharpie to establish even a few more middle tones. So try to, to do the same thing. You want to have, yeah, lots of big dark tones for sure, but you also need some of those middle tones. For complexity, variety, it's going to help to model form. Because that's the thing that e even though, you know, this is sort of a comic book, graphic novel approach where colors are not really necessarily tinted and shaded because it's it's a different sort of system for adding color. We the the artist is relying more on the inking process to establish some of those tones to create some sense of form on the two-dimensional surface on the paper. So I have the first part of the horse done. I've got my dominant dark tones, but I also have established some middle tones. Now keep in mind that the negative shape is part of the artwork too, and so you need to establish tones within the negative shape. We see evidence of that here in this Daredevil cover with the tones in the in the setting. Now that's the thing about comics, right? I mean, they're they're telling a story. Even if we go back to this graphic novel, the Romeo and Juliet, there's a setting, of course, and so the setting is full of objects. Although, look, I'm I'm looking at the, this frame, and the setting is basically just the the wall behind these characters, and so it's more of uh, of a texture but it still has tone right so the negative shape has a tonal treatment as well so in my composition that this chunk of of the negative shape is a, a middle tone so what I might do is just use some parallel lines and I have to be conscious of how close my lines are. So their, their density. Because the density is going to establish the tone. This was an area that I thought I would create some textural variations. Because I really like how, that, how, how they were created when I did the tonal plan in graphite. And the textural variations mainly come from the fact that there's tonal variations. So with the ink, what I could do is actually do some cross-hatching and create almost like shapes within shapes by changing the direction of my mark making. Which is something that I explored when I did my, my other marker piece with the faded markers. And then the other thing I can do is just tweak the density of the lines, but only in some areas, so that I have tonal variation. If you want to imply even more form with your 
patching, your shading, consider suggesting the shape of, say, some musculature by surrounding it with a specific orientation of your mark making. I'm attempting to do that right here on the horse. It starts to imply a little bit of the three-dimensional form of its abdomen here. So it's like outlining contours with your mark making, with your hatching. If you have distinct shapes that you want to add tone to, like my shadows here, here's what you can do. Lightly draw them in first, and maybe they actually are drawn already. Like maybe you've drawn them as part of the rough-in of your initial pencil sketch. I must have forgot to do that here with my leg shadows. So I lightly draw them in. Now, these are shadows, so they're going to be not a super dark tone, but something in between. So look at what I'm doing here. I didn't outline them. Instead, I'm just using these tight parallel lines to add the tone to them. And I, I know where to begin and end each line because I have my pencil outline. Then when I'm finished, I can erase the pencil. Make sure the ink dries so you don't smudge it. Sharpie dries pretty fast. And the pencil is no longer there. Only the shape. But it, it doesn't have an outline. I really like doing that with shadows. It makes them seem soft and natural. Here's a few more places where I'm allowing the orientation of my mark making to suggest the three-dimensional form of the horse. I'm happy with how the tones are coming along. I'm going to continue working in the negative shape before I move on to adding the color. When I'm working in the negative shape, I'm going to use some shorter horizontal parallel lines which enables me to suggest a lighter tone, more of a middle tone in this area. And that's based, as always, on my tonal plan. There we have it. Strong dark tones represented as shapes as they were in my tonal plan and varying the density of the ink with parallel lines and some cross-hatched lines to also establish middle tones just like we see in comic book art. Now it's time to add the color. Flat meaning it doesn't have a change in tone. As I lay down a swatch of color, we don't see a tonal change and so the shape appears flat. It does not have a lot of form as opposed to something like this, if I use a colored pencil to imply, a, and, it, and use varying pressure to imply form, to show a tonal gradation. Okay, so we don't necessarily see that in comic book art or graphic novel art, because the artist or the inker has done these kinds of things varies the density of the mark making in order to imply dark tones, middle tones, and then light tones. And of course we know that the strong light tones come from the preservation of the white of the paper. One thing I should do before I start adding color is erase the pencil drawing. I no longer need my pencil drawing, the graphite drawing, because all the Shapes and forms are established with ink now.
When you're choosing your markers to add color to your composition, which contains your dark and middle tones in the comic book style, still use a color scheme. So still approach it where you're starting with a color and then you move across the color wheel and find the colors complement. If red's my color, green is the complementary color. It's a little bit challenging to lower the intensity of marker colors, but if you are lucky enough to have a pretty large pack of markers, I've got this 36 pack of Stabler markers here, Perhaps you can find a green that already is a low intensity. So here's a green that's like an olive green, I would describe it. That's going to work well. What I would suggest is you pull out different versions of that complementary color. And then also pull out some colors that you could layer on top to change the intensity of the color. So I'm pulling out some grays and some, uh, here's a like a sort of a sienna, light sienna color. Go ahead and also pull out some colors that could be variations of red. So here's like a kind of brown red, which is a color that I used when I did the color pencil version of this project. Here's a color very similar to the Tuscan red that I used in the color pencil version. And then do a little bit of experimentation. See how the colors themselves layer, the complementary colors layer. Now remember though, we're using flat bold color. So there's my red. Now what if I go over top of it with the green? It makes a very dark tone, almost like a dark green. That's interesting. What if I go over the green with this, I would call this like a burnt sienna color. That's quite interesting. I like the looks of that. Here's a sort of tan, taupey color. Ooh, I like that. That almost looks like green to me. So I might actually use that and maybe layer some green on top of it. Now remember, this is like a comic book or graphic novel approach, so I'm trying to avoid any kind of scratchy texture. So I actually want the color to be fresh and bold and not really changing much. All right. Now, one more thing before I start. There's nothing wrong with going from here to the colored pencil. So in other words, what if you added your color to the composition with colored pencil instead of marker? It's possible, so consider that also. I'm gonna go ahead and start using this marker. Now remember that we're not using white markers. So if you want any white in your artwork, then you have to be careful to preserve your light tones. If you go back to the Star Wars comic, there certainly are some whites. So that's where, you know, you can think of it like the, the light tones of the paper have been preserved. I mean, it's likely, you can appreciate the fact that when you're printing ink, opaque inks on paper, then, you know, perhaps the color white is used in some cases. No, it's not. Scratch that. Edit that out. There's no white ink. I'm going to go ahead and start adding this red. So I'm just coloring. Coloring right on top of the black in some cases, but I don't need to color on top of the black in the really dark tone areas. I 
And maybe I'll stop in, in some areas to leave some whites. Honestly, this, these aren't the freshest markers. Maybe I'll leave the socks white of the horse. Now I'm interested to find out what will happen if I color right on top of that red with, say, this color. If you look carefully at some comic book art, there's indications where there are changes in tone of the actual color. So here's an example where on this man's suit, there is a darker and a lighter green. So in other words, the ink itself was altered. Sometimes with marker you can do that by layering the same color on top of itself. So here I, I laid down a, a layer of this taupey color, but then I kept coloring on top. So in other words, I saturated the paper even more and thereby I made a darker tone. So experiment with that if you're going to use this approach. So in other words, where you want a lighter tone of that color only color on it, only color on that section once, but where you want a darker tone, saturate the paper even more. So here I'm going to saturate the paper even more with like another layer of this same color. And you can, you can still change the tone. This marker is starting to fade out on me, so I will take advantage of that and allow it to lay down a soft tone there. Uh, sorry, a light tone, not a soft tone. So experiment with layering these colors also, but so that I'm layering some green on top there. And maybe a little bit in here. Just be creative with it. Regardless of the colors you're using, it's important to stick to a color scheme and a small number of colors. So I'm still primarily using my complementary color scheme, but I started using this tan color and on the one horse, thinking that it's a good, good match or like a good version of a, of a green kind of an olive green. So now I'm using it in the negative shape too. So remember, it's, I mean, color is important, but the tone's even more important. So you've already established the tones. So now build unity into the artwork by just using the same set of colors everywhere. And don't worry so much about like, oh, I want this horse red, I want this horse green. You wanna maintain strong unity. Okay, so like that being said, I have a red horse already, but what if I put some red down in the negative shape in the corner here? I'm gonna lay this version of red down first, and then I'm gonna take this same version of red. It's kind of like a brown red. And I'm going to go and add it to this top horse to build some unity. Yeah, I'll leave some light though on this horse.
and I'm keeping an equilibrium in mind, so I want to add some of this perhaps to the negative shape here. I'm thinking I want to lower the intensity of this red. It's just a little bit too bold for my liking. So I'm going to color over top of it with this gray. So use, use colors to neutralize other colors. Well, I think that's about it. So I have layered colors in order to actually create some middle tones in color. Like most of the tonal work comes from the black, but then I was experimenting with color saturation to create lighter and middle tones in color. And then also layering one color on top of another color to create a different tone. I did do a lot of layering one color on top of another color in order to change the intensity of a color. So knocking down the intensity of the red. And then I just like how some of the colors layer. They just created some really interesting hues. And there's my little patch of like a color that's kind of an oddball color that doesn't belong just to shake things up but I only put it in one spot. So I've been doing that really in all the pieces. So that's it. So um, I guess in the end, I kind of started deviating more into the kind of like this version where I'm being a little bit more exp expressive with the marker. So, you know, and you can see where some of the marker is faded and it's getting that scratchy line texture. So, you know, maybe it's a bit of a, a combination of this style and sort of the comic book style. But the main thing that makes it that comic book or graphic art or graphic novel style is the is starting with the heavy dark tones and the middle tones with the hatching and, and the sharpie work and then laying the color on top. So have some fun with that if, you, if that interests you.